to Hogwarts. It's time to prove yourself, to avoid peril, and realize your skill. You have the magic. Summon your talent, defeat your foes, and be Harry Potter. Hello there, it's me, your local wizard from Hogwarts. Oh, this, this is my robe that, you know, didn't happen to come with the dress shirt that I thought it would with the tie that I thought it would. Nope. Love spending 40 bucks on a little robe. But you know what I do love spending my money on beyond really awesome wands like these is internet security. And that's why I'm here to tell you about Incogni. You want to do more of this, right? And less of this looking over your shoulder, except online. That's why you need Incogni. Why? Because of data brokers creating shadow profiles on you. It's a frightening amount. Look at just how many headlines there are involving data breaches. It is truly staggering, whether it's identity theft, potential scams, or costs increasing on your end, people are taking advantage of your details online. And that's why I like Incogni. They limit public access to your personal information. And guess what? It's all automated. See this? Hands free, and it's doing it all by itself. So guess where these two hands go? That's right, back on the controller, knowing that my identity is safe and secure and that Incogni has my back. So what Incogni does is reaches out to data brokers on your behalf and requests the removal of your personal data. And they handle all the mess from there. So again, as hands-free as possible. Does this sound good to you? Why don't you head over to the link in the description down below, incogni.com slash retro. Over there, the first 100 people to use the code RETRO at the link below will get 20% off. Welcome back to Retro Rebound. In today's video, we are going through the plethora of Harry Potter video games. Boy, oh boy, are there a lot of them. So get cozy. We're doing all this because Hogwarts Legacy is soon upon us in a couple of days. Fun fact about your boy. I am not really a Harry Potter fan at all. Don't really dig the movies too much. Tried some of the books, didn't get into those. You know, when I was growing up, there was the Lord of the Rings and then there was Harry Potter. I was more of a Lord of the Rings kid. I don't know if there are parallels, if anyone remembers during the early 2000s, how you could be like one or the other or both. I just gravitated towards Lord of the Rings and let everyone enjoy their, their wizards and their wands and all that stuff. But lately I've been trying to get into it because Hogwarts Legacy looks like an amazing video game. And that's coming from me again, like a non Harry Potter fan. So I think it's saying something. So what I did was I fired up some of these games I played as a kid, whether they were at a friend's house or my own. And I'm excited to relive some of these memories with all of you. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, if you are new here and you are into retrospective and nostalgic content, you're in the right place. Do a little expecto patronum or wherever they say in those movies on the subscribe button. And now, Let's begin with the big daddy. Yes, Sorcerer's Stone for the PS2. Now, this is a really important one here right off the bat. Why is that? This game is like $70, $80 now. Don't say I don't love you. I spent a lot of money on eBay for this one. And this is where the PS1 Hello, Hagrid Harry. originates from. Not this specific version, but this is the game where PS1 Hagrid popped up around it's the web. Hagrid. It was a meme for a while. Anyway, I'm going to take my delicate time going through this complete in box experience because uh, I spent a lot of money on this one. Love the cover art here. The back says a magical new first year adventure. Help Harry uncover the secret of the Sorcerer's Stone in this brand new game for the PS2. Now, again, remember, this was the next gen version compared to the PS1. Encounter strange creatures such as the Venomous Tentacula, Devil's Snare, and Mutated G-Trash. I apologize. I should have said this well in advance. I apologize if anything gets mispronounced here. Harry Potter, not my strength, okay? Continuing on. Enhance the wizarding powers within the Spongify Spell Challenge. Explore even more exciting locations, including Ollivander's Wand Shop and Hagrid's Garden. And prepare for an extraordinary climactic final encounter with the dreaded You-Know-Who who shall not be named. Yes, I know that much. Okay, so let's pop it on open. Here we've got the manual. This manual is really underwhelming, man. For the price I paid, I opened it. I was like, certainly it's gonna be colored. Nope, nope. But they got some cool stuff here. Like it says, fear not with allies such as the lovable Hagrid, clever Hermione and wise headmaster Albus Dumbledore on hand. You'll be ready to take on you know who before you can say flippendo. So. They have a little fun in here, but I mean, how could this not be colorful? We're talking about Harry Potter here. Such a wondrous world with a black and white manual. 
It goes through all the different things you can do. A lot of platforming elements. These games were primarily focused on exploration and, of course, casting spells, which we'll get into. And you had a quest log and stuff. Surprisingly, the early Harry Potter games channeled what people are very excited about when it comes to Hogwarts Legacy. A lot of that open-endedness. But as you can see, extremely boring manual. Just descriptions of things you're going to find. puff of pods doxy, ghosts, flying books, and all that fun stuff but no real illustrations and then the EA cheat codes here on the back with a promotion for Quidditch World Cup which we'll be talking about today so that is a complete inbox experience of Sorcerer's Stone on PS2 this is a game I like to say has that you smell that it's not my costume that's that PS2 stink okay Sorcerer's Stone has the PS2 stink. Like, for example, Harry gets his wand. In the movie, it's bing, bomb, boom. It's a, a quick scene in the book, bing, bomb, boom. Quick chapter, I imagine. In this here, it's like a whole platforming section. The store stretches onto multiple rooms. And wow, they still somehow managed to skip everything. This is a perfect example of the type of tie-in games that we got growing up. Like, you know, it's funny. You have the movies that for a lot of people say gloss over things in the book in some respects and then you have the games which manage to gloss over the movies even more so so this is the most condensed 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 version of the harry potter story you could possibly consume and there are so many details left out i'll talk more about that during order of the phoenix but i digress PS2 stink all the way. What do I mean by that? Beyond just skipping over a lot of sections and stretching out weird ones, one of them is like when you pick up beans, the Bernie Bots beans, when you're running around doing that, Harry is calling out every single one. Oh, sardine. Oh, bugger. Like he's just yelling them all out every single time. It was hilarious. But yeah, there's, there's some jank here. It's clearly a first time game for Harry Potter, but it's very different. What I like is there is exploration here. You can roam around Hogwarts and that's really cool. But I think there's a game that does it a little bit better. And this is my personal favorite from the pile here. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Now, I have a bit of a memory with this one. I remember my dad came home one day. I wasn't feeling well. He came home one day and I saw Chamber of Secrets in theaters. This was one I did catch. And I remember I was feeling pretty ill on the couch and he's standing in front of the TV and he's blocking my view, but in his back pocket was a blockbuster case with this game in it. And I was wondering when I was going back to do the retrospective, like which one was the one my dad got me? It was this one. So I have some fond memories with Chamber of Secrets. And it says here, dare to return to Hogwarts. Be Harry Potter in a richer, deeper adventure. Explore an authentic, immersive Hogwarts. Confront the mysteries of the Chamber of Secrets with advanced second year magic, changing quests, and dangerous adversaries. Greater depth featuring wizard duels, very power spells, and Quidditch leagues. Take flight, hop onto your Nimbus 2000, and freely explore Hogwarts. Challenge foes, including Aragog and the fearsome Basilisk. And Harry comes to life, his internal voice will guide you as well as interacting with all your favorite characters, including Ron, Hermione, Hagrid, Dobby, and Gildroy Lockhart. So this one powers stealth, spell control. It says lead Gryffindor to the Quidditch World Cup, wizard duels. This game had it all, man. This game is legitimately awesome. And it's funny, it's one of the cheapest ones in the bunch that we have here. Now cracking it on open, complete box experience will it be good nope nope it won't be man black and white all over again you'd think again harry potter would be popping off early ps2 days uh, a lot of similar energy here to sorcerer's stone except this time we have a little border here for the chamber of secrets on the edge of each page they go through some of the items that you can buy in the game they go through the credits and, and that's it. And then we're back here with the cheat codes for EA. And let's see what they're promoting. Tie the Tasmanian Tiger. Hey, that's EA's most popular game. So that's a complete box copy of Chamber of Secrets. This one I love because it has the best exploration. Like being able to go all over Hogwarts was really cool. Being able to fly around your Nimbus, really cool. Like this game just lets you connect with the Harry Potter universe more. For me, my only exposure was again, very lightly the books and more recently just checking out some of the movies. And I never was able to draw attachment to it. I think cause I'm just not big into some fantasy IP. Harry Potter was just one that was a miss for me, but playing this game 
and remembering some of those childhood memories of when I did sit down and watch a couple of those movies. It let me connect with Hogwarts as a setting more as you'd like go up and up the ascending staircase and find out where every classroom was and be able to go into certain doors, or rather I should say picture frames and find hidden rooms. It kind of captured that fantastical nature a little bit more than I think things like the music and the spell casting does. So I really dug this, like even going into Diagon Alley, like that was awesome because I've been to Universal, for example, with, with Harry Potter World. And so being there and then seeing it in game, I was like, oh, this, this is cool. I can see why Harry Potter fans would really dig this one. But this was personally my favorite. Like I thought it was a lot of fun to play, to explore, to find collectibles. It just felt like a more cleaned up version of Sorcerer's Stone, which wasn't a bad game. Like in this game, you can go to a notice board, you can pick up side quests. So there's a lot of things to do in Chamber of Secrets. And again, having Hogwarts fully explorable, funny enough, captures what people are very excited about for Hogwarts Legacy. Now, you may wonder why that game's so exciting to people beyond it just looking good. It's hilarious. As we get deeper, you'll see how they veer further and further away from what makes these games special. One thing you can say for certain, though, is that pretty much all these spinoffs and all of these movie tie-ins are very different from one another, for better or for worse. You'll see when it gets worse. Okay, let's continue on. Harry Potter Quidditch World Cup, the only spinoff outside of the Lego game here in this pile. The back says, mount your broomstick for the favorite sport of witches and wizards. Lead any of the Hogwarts houses to victory in the Hogwarts Quidditch Cup. Then select an international team and use new skills to take aim at the Quidditch World Cup, where you compete with Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, or Draco Malfoy's Slytherin. Take control of an international team in pursuit of the greatest Quidditch prize of all, the Quidditch World Cup, and play the best Quidditch teams in the world, each with its own distinctive playing style like USA, England, France, Germany, the Nordic team, Japan, Spain, Australia, Bulgaria, featuring Victor Crumb. And go head to head with your friends in magical, fast, exciting two player action, as well as six different Quidditch challenges around Hogwarts. This game is a interesting one. I have a lot of thoughts on it, but you may have noticed I was naming out international teams in a Harry Potter game. Yes, indeed. So yes, the manuals just get more boring. Like the illustrations actually are cool. Like the chasers, the beaters, the seeker. Everyone has their own role. They say here you have three chasers, two beaters, one seeker, one keeper, and they describe each of the positions. I like that. The actual quality of the paper, I know it sounds like a weird thing to compliment, is really good in this manual. It's nice, slick, and smooth. But this gives me like early 2010s energy type manual. Like we're already near in the back. They're going through all the modes here, the World Cup, the exhibition matches. That's what you could play with your friends. And we're nearing the end here and that's really it. Now, what are they promoting here? Looney Tunes back in action. That's an interesting one. Yeah, EA used to distribute the, uh, the WB games, as I'm sure you've noticed with some of the front covers here with WB and EA. That'd be a significant partnership nowadays. But Quidditch World Cup is a game that you want to love in my opinion like i have fond memories of playing it at my buddy's house but this is a game that i feel like needs to be more than what it is for example when i was playing two player with my friend for this video you could easily steal from your friend every time you just press the x button you grab from them and then the camera rotates and now you are heading towards the goal just every single time and it just went back and forth back and forth back and forth now what's cool is like it captures some of the imagination of Quidditch, right? Where like you're going to different stages. You can play as like we did Ravenclaw versus Slytherin. Like that was cool. Like, you can do stuff like that. The story mode lets you play as anyone. Like for example, you could play as Cho Chang, you could play as Draco Malfoy. Like I thought that was kind of cool. Whereas all of these other games are based pretty firmly around Harry Potter. So it does capture that magic, if you will, pardon the pun, a little bit more. But I feel like mechanically it's not that deep. Like you can, for example, hold the pass button and throw it deeper. Uh, you can hold the shoot button and throw it a little bit harder, but it's very floaty and it's not fast enough, quite frankly. I would love to see a true Quidditch mini game. I know Hogwarts Legacy won't have that, but this feels like missed potential here and understandably for its time period, but it just feels like it's not as snappy as it should be, but there are good memories here and playing two player, it's chaotic, it's fun, but when you have two people who know how to easily steal from one another, even if you can press like triangle and you can throw out your leg and kick someone to the side, it's really tough to time and eventually someone's gonna catch up to you. It just The game has a weird flow, but once the golden snitch comes out and you gotta ride down the golden rays to chase it down, that was pretty cool. But this ultimately, when you look at the release window, this was 2003, but this was a re-release of what was effectively the PS1 game, right? So it was familiar. 
This was 2002 on the back, and this was 2003. So this was kind of like the major Harry Potter game, right? So the, the release order is interesting, but the next main movie game was, of course, Prisoner of Azkaban. I, I say that as a joke, by the way. I'm not, I'm not that stupid. Uh, you'll see here. It says that it comes with a movie ticket. I'm excited to show you that because now I have a cool complete box experience thing to show you beyond paper. What's this? Hold on. Boom. Check that out. I love that. EA did this with uh, the Lord of the Rings games as well. You'll remember, I forgot which Lord of the Rings game it was, but I did show off a movie ticket for that one. So they did it here as well for Prisoner of Azkaban. I thought that was awesome. Otherwise, though, the manual is uh, I got some funny portraits here. I noticed that with a uh, companion play, you can switch characters in this game. And I mean, look at that. We're already at the warranty. Unbelievable. Such early 2010s energy here, but we'll go to the back of the box and then we'll talk a little bit more. So it says play as Harry, Ron and Hermione face the Dementors, fly Buckbeak. There are many games and an eye toy after school's game section. Remember the eye toy? I used to get my exercise that way, man. Like there was one where there's a fruit chopping mini game or you would like punch things coming in from every corner of the screen. I love the eye toy growing up. That'd be a fun random video one day to do, but I don't know if anyone even recalls that. That was like the start of motion gaming, like seeing yourself in the game and throwing punches. I had so much fun with the eye toy, but Prisoner of Azkaban, this is where you could start to see EA's sim technology pop up. So EA was making the Sims games early on and uh, yeah, they would technically borrow their assets, which makes sense to save themselves money. And this game, like when you look at Hermione's model and like her eyes popping out of her head, such early Sims energy here. And I'm not even a big Sims fan. And even I saw that one went, wow. But there are noticeable differences here. Uh, for example, it starts a little bit quicker. The other Harry Potter games I mentioned outside of Quidditch World Cup are pretty slow starts uh, where you're just focused on exploring, learning the magic. And it can be, especially as a kid, like probably a little bit boring. This game, you know, you start off on the train, the Dementors are attacking. So it's a little bit quicker. Once you get to Hogwarts, one thing I noticed that was different from the other two games was actually that the pictures on the wall are animated this time and they'll talk to you so it brings that aspect of the movies and the books to life here i also noticed this game has the best suite of spells among the starting three uh, where you could target enemy weaknesses for example like you could use flipendo on certain enemies or there were sometimes you had to reflect a spell back at an enemy it becomes very rigid where sometimes you need to do like overly specific things but i like that because it felt more purposeful and responsive these early harry potter games didn't have very responsive combat so this at least felt like something there but really what i want to talk about is the game boy advance version for this game the game boy advance version for this game was like a golden sun style game and that was really really awesome and one of the early game boy color harry potter games was actually like an old school final fantasy game i'd like to see more of that personally more of that energy but you know me you know how i feel i'm a little biased maybe we'll play that separately on the channel who knows I'm toying around with a lot of ideas here, clearly. But that's what's going on with Prisoner of Azkaban. Next we have, oh boy, Goblet of Fire. Oh God almighty. I mean, I love the cover art, but oh God, this game. Wow, going back to this one was a trip. Here we got, can you master the magic? Experience the excitement of the movie when you play as Harry, Ron, and Hermione in a breathtaking... That's, it takes your breath away in the wrong way. Uh, adventure packed with action and magic. Combine your magic and play with up to two friends to create more powerful charms and jinxes. Experiment with magic. Explore the world of Hogwarts to combine new spell uses and compete in the Triwizard Tournament facing deadly Hungarian horntail dragons, the icy depths of the Black Lake, and an enchanted maze. Oh, man. I really like this movie, by the way. I know some people call it like hit or miss because they skip, I think, like 16 chapters of the book, but... I kind of dig it. The manual, pain, 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 pain. You got to like, look at Ron, man. Look at my man, Ron. What's going on there, buddy? <laughs> he looks like me in middle school. And then it talks about the pensive, the equipping of collector's cards, which is kind of your upgrade, saving and loading, and, and, and that's it. That's it. And then nothing on the back. No promotion. EA was really saving paper here. So shout out to them for protecting the planet. But that's your complete box copy of Goblet of Fire. All right. This game is terrible. Oh my God. So they changed out the exploration of the first three Harry Potter tie-ins. And like I said, this is where they started to veer from the path. And they went for more of a Shrek 2, poor man's kind of Lord of the Rings style game. Remember, EA was kind of the movie tie-in company for a while. They were doing Marvel games. They were doing Lord of the Rings games, as we talked about on this channel. And they were doing... Harry Potter games. 
Now, in the Lord of the Rings games, let's say you're playing two towers, what you would do is you'd do combos and you'd get good, perfect, as ratings for your combos. And then you'd get an overall rating at the end of the mission and you'd spend that type of points on upgrades. Same framework here, but somehow it's extremely messy. Like when you finish up certain missions, you'll get beans and you'll be able to spend them on cards and then you can equip these cards on very limited sets like plus 10 stamina to Harry. Oh boy. But there's also like even me as someone who knows very little about Harry Potter, they'll say Axio instead of Accio. Like I'm just like, how, how did you mess this up if I don't even know what I'm doing here at this point in time? Like this is ridiculous, but this game is awful. You can play a co-op with a friend though. You can play it with a friend. So there is that benefit. But like when I made my friend suffer through this one as well, it was just like, dude, can, can we shut this off please? Like it was a couple missions and we were like, I think we've seen enough. I think I got enough gameplay for this video. Let's, <laughs> let's move on to the next one, shall we? So yeah, Goblet of Fire is an absolute miss. This game is bad. It is definitely the worst one of the bunch so far. The best one of the bunch so far, if you were to ask me outside of Chamber of Secrets, Order of the Phoenix. I love this movie too, by the way. I just kind of love how it gets political with Umbridge, Dumbledore's army, you know, the denial of he who shall not be named. I kind of like that. But anyway, the back of the box here says, discover the magic of Hogwarts. Explore all of Hogwarts to recruit Dumbledore's army, overthrow Umbridge, and prepare to fight Voldemort and his Death Eaters. Immerse yourself in magic, relive the magic of the movie, and unleash advanced magic. Now, this game's got a pretty cool mechanic. Let's see if the manual highlights it. Wait, we got two slips in here. I don't, I don't remember this. What do we got here? Oh, we got a promotion for a cell phone game. Yeah, wow. A flip phone game. Wow. EAMobile.com. Go ahead, check that out. Manual here is pretty cool on the front cover. Let's see if on the inside... They break anything down. Okay, this is actually cool. This actually feels like a book. So this is why it's my favorite. As you'll see here, you got little thumbstick inputs. So remember how on the channel we covered Naruto Rise of a Ninja. And in that game, you would use the right analog stick while holding a trigger to do jutsu inputs. Think about that, but with this game here. So you'll see here, like Wingardium Leviosa, you go up and then left and right, and you go back and forth. For Akio, you go down, down. Depulso, up, up. Reparo, you go in circles. Reducto, you go in the circle the opposite way. And, and that is kind of how they do it. They have dueling spells like Stupefy and Expelliarmus to disarm. Like each one had their own specific thing that it did. And because you did it with the analog stick, it was very interactive. And I loved that about this game. I mean, look at the sketch work here. Really good job. Much more inspired product this time around. The wizard games are fun. Look at all this. Excellent work here, EA. Excellent work. And then, wow, Voldemort just really losing his mind here on the save and loading section. And there you go. That's the manual here. So definitely, in my opinion, the best complete box experience as well. Shout out to Order of the Phoenix. But this game, again, is cool because of the right thumbstick input. What you lose with that is a bit of camera control. Like if you were to try to look to your right when you're running around, it's going to pull out your wand and he's going to whip it to the right. So there is that you have to account for. Eventually, you can hold the trigger and rotate it. That was also in Half-Blood Prince, which we'll talk about. This game also has the best cutscenes. It does skip over, again, a lot of stuff, but it does have a lot going for it because you can pretty much interact with every object. Like, when I got to Hogwarts, I just picked up a bench and started waving it around. I was like, let me see if I can hit Ron with this. Boom. Let me see if I can hit some random students with it. Boom. I was like, this is awesome. Like, this is the interactivity I'm looking for. But it had the exploration, if you will, of Chamber of Secrets. Maybe not as far Spread, but you could go to all these different floors and it had all of those elements, but on a next gen level, plus the interactivity with the wand, it just made it cool. Like it just had the next gen Chamber of Secrets vibes here. So this one is awesome. I really did dig it a lot. Even if people found, I think the story kind of hit or miss because it's again very political, so it's very slow. Uh, it's very meticulous in its combat, but I liked it. So next on the list here, we got the family game, apparently. Half-Blood Prince. All right. On the back of the box, see, you can tell when you're going to get a dud and when you're going to get a good one. Like, look how inspired this is, right? You have the gradient kind of coming outwards. Then you got this. And it's like, oh, white text and uh, imagery. Nice. We, we tried for that one. Some of the wizard within you. Relive the magic of the movie. Create magical potions with Professor Slughorn. Join Gryffindor's Dueling Club. And perfect your Quidditch skills. Okay. What we got going on here? You pop it on open. Got this manual right here. Hold on now. Hold on now. Oh, 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 oh. Yep. 
black and white again. Harry's sixth year, though. We're getting there, man. We're getting up there now. And as you'll see, uh, it's it's more of what you saw in actually Order of the Phoenix, but what they're doing here is brewing potions. We'll talk about that. There's dueling clubs. They brought that back. Quidditch is back. So a little bit of that is explored here. The Endless Day. If you haven't found all of the crests or complete all the challenges, you can continue the Endless Day once the narrative is complete. So you can continue to explore the world, which was pretty cool. So this is another decent one. I think this is like the best stretch right here, quite frankly. Like I like both these games a decent amount. Now, Half-Blood Prince, like some of the visuals I gotta say mm, I don't know like when you look at Hermione's model at the start of the game I'm like was that I actually thought like I was bugging out I was like is that her that is her what no way so yeah there's a focus on Quidditch there's a focus on potion crafting Quidditch feels a lot better here a little bit faster uh, it, it's a little janky but again I think games are having trouble keeping up with the speed of Quidditch because they need space for Quidditch but this game does a pretty good job what it also does a good job of is the mini game nature of it. Like potion crafting is kind of fun. Now it's taking shapes and colors and kind of matching them up and pouring and into a overall vial until you're hitting that matching color and not overdoing it or else you'll have to redo it. So it's fun, it's playful. And that's kind of the defining quality of this game. It has the Order of the Phoenix mechanics with additional mini games on top with more exploration. So it's a pretty strong one. And instead of collecting beans, finally, you're collecting crests. And these crests are laid throughout the entirety of Hogwarts. So there's a reason to kind of double back pick them back up here, which I thought was cool. And there's better guidance in this game. You can summon Headless Nick and he'll kind of come out of nowhere and just start bringing you to your objective. So that's a little bit more enjoyable in the terms of exploration. Now these last two, I'm going to do as a package before we get into the final game because they're just kind of two peas in a pod, aren't they? We have Deathly Hollows part one and part two. Love the art here for part two, but anyway, we have Deathly Hollows part one, part two. This spells war, join the battles of Hogwarts, very little going on on the back of the box. And then here on the inside, we'll start off with Deathly Hollows part one, where it's got a pretty thick manual here promoting create. I actually don't know what that is for me, yay, but uh, they've, they've put out a number of games here. And then it goes over Harry's quest and the magic and the controls and all the different spells and what they can do. This is important because we're already at the warranty. That is hilarious. Um, this is, all because they decided to make Harry Potter a third-person shooter moving forward. So we went from exploration to co-op beat-em-up to now this sort of shoot-em-up, and it's crazy. So we'll take a look at Deathly Hollows Part 2 and then discuss further. So cracking this one open, got a bit of a thicker manual here. Harry's final quest. This is it. This is the moment. And we're at the end. <laughs> I always get a kick out of it. Yeah, I, I know it, it's for a lot of you probably played out, but I just get a kick out of how thin all these manuals have been. Like, has there really been a major difference between these and something like Sorcerer's Stone? It's been a couple of page difference, but they all have been black and white, which is hilarious. I guess at least EA was consistent. So both these games here are third person shooters, as I said. Deathly Hollows Part 1, probably the worst feeling, floatiest third person shooter I've experienced ever. When I was riding on Hagrid's bike and I was trying to aim and shoot, I was like, oh, this feels terrible. And then they gave me like a soft lock on thing. I went, oh, this is really bad. Mm, no, man, this the cover system, awful. Everything about this game as a third person shooter is terrible. Like even as you're shooting, like the reticle expanding, the frame rates diving through the floor. I'm just like, this feels awful to play. They give you protecto or whatever the heck it's called where you like put a shield in front of you. That was cool. But like since getting in the covers janky, there's no flow. There's no rhythm here. Now, Deathly Hollows Part 2 is passable, but what you're losing with both Deathly Hollows games is the exploration, the interaction. It's just an on-rails shooter. Definitely the lower effort of the entire group here. So, Deathly Hollows Part 2, I have a great story. I remember my buddy and I went to GameStop. We had this GameStop trick, we called it. We'd go to GameStop with 90 bucks. We spent it one time. And then every time we'd go back to GameStop one week later at max, we would return the games that we had played for that week, which we bought used. And GameStop would have to take them. That was a part of their policy. Because if you bought used games from them, you could just tell them we didn't like it. And so we just go back and I didn't care if it was a goaded game. I'd be like, I didn't like it. I didn't like it. And I just kept recycling those 90 bucks. So one week I picked up Rage and my buddy Ivan had picked up Deathly Hollows Part 2. 
And I remember he wanted to start up YouTube, so he did this whole Let's Play of Deathly Hollows Part 2. He recorded it, and I was playing Rage in his other room with my buddy Connor, and I remember we were having a great time, and Ivan comes out of his room. He was locked in there for six hours just recording stuff and really dialed in. He comes out. He's sweating. He goes, that game was intense, bro. So this game does right all the wrongs of Deathly Hollows Part 2. Like, it really does. It's, it's much smoother to play. It's much more enjoyable to play. It's got better cover mechanics. It's got better shooting. It's just overall a lot more tight, except the AI. The AI in this game is still bad. They'll kind of walk around like this at you slowly. And you still get that very, like, C-tier, D-tier kind of movie tie-in energy, but... I mean, I just have a funny memory with that game, so I do look at it a little more fondly, but when you look at these two side by side and then you play them, real night and day difference, but you, again, lose the ability to explore Hogwarts, which I think was the best part of them all. So it is a little bit unfortunate, but those games are rough. So as you can see, it's a general progression from like, oh, we have all this fun exploration, and then we get like the next gen exploration, we get a weird beat em up spin off. And then you get third person shooters. Like I said, you can fault EA for how they executed it, but none of them are really the same, which was kind of cool going back to them. Because when we do these remembering videos, like when I did Lord of the Rings, when I did Two Towers to Return of the King, I'm like, what's there to say about Return of the King other than it looks a little bit better? I mean, there was more to say, but very little. At least with each of these games, they're all very different. So I imagine when I go through the comments, like a lot of you are going to go, oh, I love this one or I love that one. And I think that's cool that it can speak to different audiences. One last game, Lego Harry Potter. The battle is building. Encounter new forces, new challenges, and more magic and prepare for the ultimate showdown with Lord Voldemort. With over 150 unlockable characters, you know I had to squeeze a Vita game in here. Yeah, there's the whole collection on PS4, but you know, I had this in my Vita collection. I was like, That'll do the job. If I can show up the Vita, I will. Nothing here in the complete box, really. But otherwise, this is all the movies, the books, whatever, in one game. Now, in this case, it's years five through seven, but in the general Harry Potter uh, Lego collection, it's all of them. Um, so you kind of get that Lego Star Wars treatment, right? As you go from movie to movie to movie, same thing here with Lego Harry Potter. But the benefit is you kind of get that feeling you got during Quidditch World Cup and some of the other Harry Potter games where you get to play as other characters. It's like nice. And you get that usefulness of these characters. Uh, but you also get that Sorcerer's Stone energy of like, this part of the movie is stretched out like this, man. So it's a fun time. It's a Lego game at the end of the day, though. What, what hasn't been said about a Lego game? So that's it, everybody. Those are the Harry Potter video games. All of them crazy amount of them of course there are various versions of them like game boy advance game boy color so on and so forth which you covered here but yeah not many spin-offs is what i learned that's why hogwarts legacy is kind of significant because all the harry potter games are just well they have harry potter in the name hogwarts legacy is like the first one to step out of that realm so that's all i've got for you i'm looking forward to seeing your thoughts on it in the comments down below and until next time i will catch you in the next retro rebound peace out